Hello, hello everyone. My name is Daniel Cooney. I am from the United Nations Environment Program. We, we know that if we're going to move the world to a more sustainable pathway, we have to have young people on board. Young people make up more than half of the world's population. But what we have realized is that we don't need to convince young people. They're out there, they're leading, because it's their future that is most at stake. It's the young people who are going to have to clean up the mess that they inherit. So at the United Nations, part of what we are trying to do is to highlight the amazing initiatives that are going on around the world led by young people. We hope that these initiatives will inspire the rest of the world, inspire today's leaders to take action. Three years ago, we launched a program called the Young Champions of the Earth. It's an annual global competition in which we identify seven amazing young environmental entrepreneurs. We give them a cash prize to implement a big idea that they propose, and we give them a year of mentorship and guidance. My panel today is made up of three of the seven 2019 winners. Before I introduce them, I just want to show you a very short video about our program. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It's been said, nothing's more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But one thing is more powerful, the people who make that idea a reality. The ones brave enough to leave behind old formulas, who dare to invent the future. Nonconformists, disruptors, innovators. Making new tools and forging new careers. They come from every corner of the globe. Different in every way but one. They are young. And they know tomorrow belongs to those who see beyond today. In the breakdown, they see a chance for breakthrough. For people, for planet, and maybe even profit. The United Nations is seeking inspired young problem solvers with big, bold ideas for the environment, for humanity, for a greener future. Does that sound like you? If chosen as a UN Young Champion, you'll be connected with accomplished mentors, customized training, and seed funding to turn your dream into a reality. Is this your chance to lead a new wave of green careers? To step up and make a difference? There's only one way to find out. Come see if you have what it takes to become a young champion of the Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce three of our current batch of young champions. Uh, I'm going to introduce them all uh, individually and ask them to, to tell you uh, what each of them is doing. Ana Luisa from Brazil, please. What's, what is your big idea? Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a technology that I first developed when I was 15 years old. Now I'm 22. And uh, it's called Aqualus and can make the water drinkable using uh, a treatment by solar radiation. Right now, we benefit more than 1,000 people in Brazil in the arid zones, but with the potential to clean water in every arid zone of the world. Omaritani. Thank you. Omar Itani from Lebanon, please tell us what you're doing. Uh, I co-founded a startup named Fabricade. Uh, we enable underprivileged communities to get decent clothing at affordable prices through increasing the efficiency of secondhand clothes collection, sorting, and redistribution. 
In the past year, we have recycled around 100 tons of clothing, distributed more than 100,000 items to underprivileged communities for prices ranging between uh, maximum 0.3 to $2 per item. We moved from a company in 2017 that had two employees to more than 100 within less than two years. And hopefully, with the help of UN and supporters here in UAE, we'll even grow further in the upcoming future. And Sonika Mananda from, from Nepal, please tell us of your project. Uh, sure. So um, 30 years ago, uh, Nepal uh, became a pioneer, green city pioneer, by launching fleet of public transportation, these electric minibuses around, uh, on the road, right? Um, 30 years ago, and then now the sector is really dr dying, and then the sector that was driven by women is really dying. So we tried to find out what was the problem. We, we, uh, we dig down the problem and then we found out that the problem was access to finance to these women micro entrepreneurs. So we thought, why not uh, we bring in, there are a lot of climate funding that's available, a lot of carbon offset funding that's available. So we thought, why not start a platform uh, that really links and matches these green micro entrepreneurs that works in grassroots to these high up um, uh, climate fundings. That's what we are doing using digital tokens. Thank you. We're now going into our fourth year of this program, and what we've seen since the start of it is that every year the number of applicants has doubled. And last year, when these three amazing individuals came through the competition, we had almost 3,000 applicants from around the world. Young people want to be heard, young people have great ideas. I'd like to ask the panel, please, how can young people have the most impact? Should it be like Greta Thunberg out on the street protesting? Should it be, as you all are doing, implementing projects? Should it be something else, or is it a mix? Who, who would like to start? I can start. Uh... Personally, I can reflect on my own experience. I come from a country where the government is quite incapable of doing any change. Uh, and it's up for us, for the youth, to do it. If any change is going to happen in my country, it's going to happen by the youth. Uh, the private sector is struggling, and the government is incompetent. Uh, and that's why for us it's a duty to participate in public and private affairs to help solve imminent environmental, social, and economic problems we have. For me, it was never a decision, or it was never uh, like, a, a, do I want to go into something that helps my community or not? We had no other choice. Nobody was doing anything, and the problem was uh, going stronger and stronger. Older generations were tending to just accept it. But I, I, I'm 24 years old. I still have, the average age in Lebanon is around 80. So I still have around 60 years to live. I don't want to live in such a country. I don't want to live in such conditions. So for us, for the youth, we just need to start from not accepting the situation. Once we don't accept it and we fight it, either through, either on the streets or in private initiatives or in public initiatives or in, in working with in, inside corporates trying to, to transfer those corporates to become more sustainable, whatever you are, you need to start from not accepting the situation and fighting it in whatever source, uh, skills or resources you have. And as are young people in Lebanon being heard, uh, now we have a revolution. It has been going for 90 days. Around 75% of the participants in this revolution are, beyond, are below the age of 30. So, uh, and they were able to turn the government. Uh, I think out of 90% of the social initiatives in Lebanon are led by people under the age of 30. So are we making macro change, macro level change? There is some doubt on that because the situation is quite hard. But are we the only people trying to drive some change? Definitely we are. It's worth a try. I'm not saying that if youth try to make things better, it will succeed and things will be uh, amazing and rainbows. But it, it's, it's the only option we have. There's no other option. We need to go and to take matter into our own hands. Success is not guaranteed, but at least we have a chance. And Sonica, can I ask you, from Nepal, you're working with the private sector. How, how can young people influence 
the practices of the private sector to push them, nudge them into more sustainable ways? Um, sure. Um, if I may, I'd like to um, um, ask everyone uh, to close your eyes for, for a moment and think about home. What, what comes in your mind? Your street, your house as a building that you live in, your city, your country. Now again, if I take you up above the space, let's say you are in the International Space Station. Now think about home. What comes in your mind? What do you see as a home? Earth, right? I mean, if we can, um, as, as a youth or as anyone, if we can bring that awareness that Earth is our only home, be it private sector, be it public sector, you know, be it anyone, then I think half of the climate change problem would be solved. I think that is what really drives my company and my project, Green Energy Mobility, to work with private sector, and I think that is really working also. We're trying to see how, um, because we really believe in, you know, uh, the problem won't be solved from high above, above. We really want to empower the grassroots micro-entrepreneurs so that, that's, so that there are thousands of people who are solving climate change, not just one person or one institution or one, you know, like private institution. So that's, that's the drive that we are uh, bringing in from the grassroots level and including the private sector. Actually, we also work with public sector though. But um, yeah, so we, we, are, we are kind of aggregating all type of stakeholders into our platform so that all play their part to solve this uh, big challenge. And do you see movement? Do you see the private sector, large business, moving in the right direction with government in hand? Um, I think uh, the, problem of, um, the problem of working together is usually the trust. One, one sector does not trust the other sector. Let's say there, there are a lot of funding available for climate, uh, uh, climate micro-entrepreneurs or climate startup, let's say. But why, why the fund is not really flowing into the direction? Let's say uh, if a bank has a fund or, or credit available for green micro-entrepreneurs, let's say for electric mobility, but why, why the bank is not very, um, uh, you know, like how can, we, how can they de-risk their, uh, their funding channel, channel towards the green micro-entrepreneurs? I think that's the missing link that we are trying to uh, address through our solution, which is uh, basically uh, automatic fund tracking from the source to the destination using digital tokens. So now um, uh, the private sector funding or the public sector funding or, or any banking credit uh, uh, would know where the money is right now. You know, like, because if they are giving out money to buy, let's say, an electric vehicle for a green micro-entrepreneur, green, uh, green um, well, mobility dri driver, then they know where they are using their money. So it's kind of um, de-risking the whole uh, ecosystem. That's, that's the kind of, um, yeah. So I think um, there is a necessity, and people have felt the necessity. That's why the project is really growing. So we are really hopeful about that. Ana Luisa, let's turn to Brazil for a moment. You have your fair share of environmental challenges. This year, we've seen record fires in the Amazon. What are the young people doing about it? How are they being heard? Well, in my experience, and uh, I, I talk uh, for the young entrepreneurs, and uh, young social business back there in Brazil, we are trying to uh, kind of install a culture of young leaders. So we have uh, many, many associates, many organizations that uh, in events back in Brazil and also all around the world, trying to create this expand this culture inside the country. We have, uh, specifically, Brazil is a really big country, but uh, in my region, that is Bahia, we have uh, uh, participation of the young people in, uh, in the scenario of the sustainability. Uh, we create 
startups, we create NGOs to kind of, to in install this culture and make the adults, the older people, uh, to join us and try to change the the planet beginning with our own cities, states, and countries. Uh, of course, it's not easy, and uh, it's not going to happen in a day or in a year, but uh, we are making progress, and uh, I think that it's making progress also in other places of the world. So we see a lot of, a lot of companies adopting the language of sustainability. I think partly because they've realized that a large percentage of, of, their, of, their, of their customers value sustainability. But are we seeing companies doing enough? Are, are young people becoming more aware that they, can, that they can drill down through the PR speak and actually be able to look for companies that are really w walking the talk. And Luisa, in Brazil, you know, ha the issue of sustainability, the issue of environmental awareness, respect for the environment, how far are companies going? And how are the youth actually succeeding in pushing them? Um, the companies in Brazil, mainly the, the ones that are Brazilian companies, are still not that sustainable in my point of view. But uh, we have uh, the other company that are uh, multinational that works in Brazil. That we start to see uh, their sustainable uh, acts inside the, the country, and it may be con contaminated the the other companies that are Brazilians. Uh, but right now, it's still a very small actions doing by the the company. And uh, we are creating this uh, kind of to, uh, to make everyone to understand that if we want to be sustainable, we need to demand this for the company. And uh, if the company sees that for them to have us as customers, they need to be sustainable, then uh, it will create a movement and more companies will become more sustainable. I think that will, will take a, a long time in Brazil, but we have seen this already in Europe and uh, the US. And Omar, you're in the business of trying to get people to recycle their clothes. You're a threat to fast fashion, a oh. multi-billion dollar industry. So. How do young people look at this? I mean, I don't see any, any reduction of the numbers of people walking into Zara and other fast fashion stores, but how are you making inroads? Because I know that your business is growing. How are you making inroads with the young? Sure. So first, through stating the facts, and that's one of the reasons behind my participation today. Uh, when people think about pollution, they think about the aviation industry, the oil and gas industry. It's important to state that the fashion industry is the second biggest polluter in, uh, polluter in the world. And it's, uh, people try to reject this fact because we don't want to believe that things we put on our body, things so intimate to ourselves, are one of the biggest causes of pollution, whether environmental or even social, in child labor and sweatshops. So through exchanging those facts and giving people an alternative. So if you go in conferences and we speak and we speak and we speak, but there's no infrastructure on the ground that allows people to recycle their clothes and to get recycled clothes, we are not doing anything. And that's what we try to do on, at Fabricate. We try to advocate for that through social media, through TV channels, uh, through interactions and conferences and build the infrastructure. Within the last two years, we were able to install more than 400 clothing collection bins uh, up in around five different shops, vintage shops. And we are starting to seeing a big trend in people uh, deciding to use vintage clothing, not beca only because it's stylish, not only because it's more affordable, not only because it's more environmentally friendly, but also because it, we, tr we made sure to make it the trend. And we are taking market share from the major brands in Lebanon, whether they were Zara, Nike, Adidas. Uh, 
And instead of only combating those, uh, those brands, we are also collaborating with them. Uh, so with Nike, for example, we, we collect uh, all of their stock from a uh, uh, big, big chunk of their stock in Lebanon, unsold stock. We are collaborating with those brands to make sure that we can recycle their unused stock. And now it's, it's, it's a huge problem for them. They need us. They need the presence of recycling uh, initiatives in the fashion industry. Less than 20% of clothes is recycled. The market is humongous. It's second, the second-hand clothing market is growing in double digits, double the fast fashion market. So it's a growing market, and it's there. They, don't, they can't combat it. They need to work with it. And that's a fact. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. In under one minute, can I ask each of you, what is your one message for the young generation of today to protect the planet? Sonika, should we start with you? Um, sure. Um, I think to, right now is the better time young people are being heard, um, be it through the protest, be it through storytelling, or be it through uh, startups like mine. Um, so we just heard um, energy is a trillion dollar company, so if you can solve climate change and get a share of that, now is the right time. <laughs> that's, that's my message. Uh, for me, I think uh, entrepreneurship, like dare to become entrepreneurs, dare to solve problems, creating infrastructures and companies that can allow you to do so. We just saw the example of Mr. Bill and how a, an entrepreneur can have an immense impact on environment and society and economy. And I think youth, we can do this. When we started at Fabricate, we had less than $2,500. Now our turnover is around a million. And that, we never waited for funding so we can start working. There is a misconception that before, before having money, you cannot start working. That's wrong. You can start working with whatever channels you have, whatever skills and capacity you have. And once you prove yourself on the ground, funding will come, uh, advocacy will come, uh, support and consultants and the UN will come to support you. But in the beginning, I would try to, to, to help you with an, uh, uh, and I wish that I can, uh, this message can reach you with that we can start wherever we are with whatever skills and capacities we have. Once we start working on the ground, support will come later. Don't wait for support to start your initiatives. Start with whatever resources and skills you have. Anna Luisa? Uh, to, just to complement, I think that we are the generation of technology. We should use them uh, in our favor to change the world. It's easier for young people to use the technology for good than for the oldest, and I guess this was, that was going to be the solution. And um, I, I, I agree with uh, Omar about saying that uh, building uh, projects, startups, uh, and creating scientific projects it's going to be our future. We need to create solution. There is several problems here to be solved. And uh, we as young, we, and, and most part of the young people, we have more time as we are in uh, school, in uh, college, we have all the extra to, to mix our time and our technology to create solutions. And can I just ask, before we wrap up, where is, we've seen, we've all seen the, the uh, TV news and, and maybe in person of, of the protests on the street, the Fridays for Future movement. It appears it's just gonna grow. Is there any, any sort of thoughts on that? Where is, where, where is that gonna be in one year's time? Um, where is that gonna be? when the world comes together for the climate summit at the end of this year in the UK. Where is the youth movement going to be? Bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. We need to, to push this movement further and further in more cities. Make it not only Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays. We need, we need to make sure that the people doing the public policy are aware of what we want. We are going to outlive them. Tenth of years. It's our life, it's our future, and they need to hear us. And that's why such movements need to continue, and they need to channel their energy and create infrastructure, create companies, create entrepreneurial activities to back up their, uh, their endeavors. Ladies and gentlemen, the Young Champions of the Earth program 
is the largest youth, environmental youth initiative in the United Nations. We want to grow this program. It's only been in existence for three years. We want to grow it. We want to find and help dozens of young people like these to be able to implement their dreams, to be able to scale them, to be able to show the world that we can make a difference, that there is hope. One of the most important things I believe that they represent is a means to change the narrative about the environment from one that is constantly about doom and gloom to one of hope. Because without hope, we're not going to tackle the environmental crisis we face. So therefore, I'm going to make a sh sort of a shameless plug that we are looking for new partners at the United Nations. We're looking for new partners to help us scale this program, to grow it. So therefore, please, if any of you are interested, please come and see me or the young champions at the end of this, and we'd be happy to start a conversation. So ladies and gentlemen, please thank my amazing panelists. They're doing amazing work, and thank you very much.